Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure to welcome Murong Ra from uh, University of Southern California. He'll be talking about cloud-enabled mobile sensing systems. A large part of this talk is, in fact, a preview of what the rest of the world will only get to hear at NSDI. So this is uh, faster for you guys. Uh, with that, uh, welcome Murong, and take it from here. Thanks for the introduction, Aman. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me today as a candidate. So I want to say that it's my honor to give a talk here today. Um, today, my name is Muryong Ra from USC. And today I'm going to talk about cloud-enabled mobile sensing systems, and especially how to enable efficient processing and secure sharing of sensor data using the cloud. So nowadays, almost everyone has one or more smart mobile devices. So these mobile devices are not just selling well, but deeply changing many aspects of our lives. The changes are from how we interact with each other, to where we eat, where we meet, and how we experience a visit to the doctor, and how we pay bills, etc. So with these smart mobile devices, numerous apps have been developed, and this has become indispensable in our everyday life. So compared to desktop PC or laptop, so one of the distinctive features of smart mobile devices is the existence of sensors. So modern smart mobile devices already have a variety of sensors, such as camera, GPS, microphone, compass, and motion sensors like accelerometer and gyroscope, and many others. So these sensors on mobile, smart mobile devices provide users rich contextual information to enable novel features. So based on these sensors, many useful mobile sensing applications have been developed. Video sharing, the arguably intelligent personal digital assistant, and photo sharing and location-based services are widely used. And some of them have humongous user base. The Facebook has over 1 billion active monthly users. And Google Maps for Mobile has more than 100 million active monthly users. And note that all these applications are enabled by the cloud. So this cloud-enabled mobile sensing systems and applications are the focus of this talk. And all these applications use the cloud mainly because they are resource constrained. So the computing power is less uh, powerful than the desktop PC or laptop, and they have smaller storage space also. And although rapidly evolving, the wireless network is less reliable than wired network and not always available. An immoral battery problem is well known in mobile computing community. For example, ever since mid-1990s, the battery density has been improved only two times every 10 years. So cloud certainly gives a great opportunity for mobile devices because of its high availability, nearly infinite storage space, and millions of compute cores. So as I described, there exist many useful cloud-enabled mobile sensing systems and applications. So my, uh, the problem is people always desire fast application with more features, and there are growing concerns of security and privacy. So my thesis focused on the system support to realize these growing demands and to resolve existing concerns on cloud-enabled mobile sensing applications. So in this context, we have several challenges to overcome in sensor data sharing and processing. First, we often face performance problem when we deal with compute-intensive, compute and data-intensive mobile workloads. And second, whenever we share large volumes of sensor data with others using the cloud, there is a tension between efficient sensor data sharing and privacy protection. This is not an easy problem to solve immediately. And third, when we share the large volumes of data from the corpus of smartphone users, it is often very challenging to efficiently deal with labor-intensive subtasks. So the question is, what kind of programming abstraction do we need to address this problem? And lastly, the, whenever we share large volumes of data using mobile devices, the energy problems are always there. So given the challenges, my research goal is to enable efficient processing and secure sharing of sensor data using the cloud. So my, as I described, my thesis work is tightly connected to sensor data sharing and processing. 
So I made an effort to overcome several challenges that I described in the previous slide. So this is about enabling mobile perception application focused on performance. And P3 is about how to protect users' privacy against uh, providers when sharing photos. And Medusa is a high-level programming framework for crowd sensing. And Salsa is about how to trade off energy and delay when sharing large volumes of data. But before delving into the details, I would like to briefly cover some technical aspects of my thesis research project. So in Odessa project, I deal with data flow programming language and built a runtime based on workload characterization. In P3, I developed an image encryption and decryption algorithm based on signal image processing knowledge. And I built a software, I built a system that, use, that, is, that uses software interposition architecture that re-engineers photo upload and download protocols of existing photo sharing service providers. And in Medusa project, I designed a domain-specific language and built a partition runtime across mobile devices and the cloud. For those who are interested, I release the Medusa implementation on Google Code. This is open source project. And in Sarsa, I exploited application delay tolerance to design online network interface selection algorithm using Lapinov analysis. So this underlying system is deployed at Los Angeles International Airport and other universities and companies for more than two years. And in addition, um, when I was an intern at here at MSR with Surge Group, I focused on the continuous sensing application and characterized the workload based on the simulator and actual measurement on two very different types of processes. So in today's talk, I'm going to cover the first two projects in depth, and I'm going to summarize the other two pieces of work at the end of the talk. So here's the outline of the talk. So I already introduced my problem space and my research. Now I'm moving to the first part. So how, do we, how should we offload the computation to the cloud to enable demanding applications and why the existing approaches now are not directly applicable? So as I already mentioned, um, smartphones have sensors. And these sensors enabled a set of sensing applications such as activity recognition, health and traffic monitoring, location-based services, etc. But recent advances of computation, sensing, and communication capabilities of smart mobile devices create a new class of application that we call interactive perception applications. So unlike the other sensing applications in this slide, the mobile perception applications make use of high data rate sensors like cameras. Here are some examples of such application. So we use three prototype, the interactive perception applications. The first one is face recognition application. So at the conference, for example, one swipes people's faces to immediately recognize who is in the room. And second application is object and pose recognition application to enable augmented reality. And third application is a gesture recognition application to control tablet device using simple hand gestures uh, to navigate the UI. So these emerging applications have the following characteristics. So they are interactive, typically requires the crisp response time in the order of 10 to 200 milliseconds. And high data rate because of video data. This is real-time video data. And computer intensive because the computer vision-based algorithms are typically used. So when we run these applications on mobile devices, we will have significant performance problem. So to understand this, two measures of goodness will characterize the requirements of interactive perception applications. The throughput is how many image frames the system can process per second also often denoted as FPS, frames per second. And MaxPen is end-to-end -end latency of a compute pipeline for a given a single frame, which is basically a response time of a given recognition task. So in general, we want to achieve high throughput and low MaxPen. To verify the, how severe the performance problem is, here is one experimental data on three prototype applications. So each application runs locally on mobile devices. And as you can sense from the video on the right side, this is too slow to use. So note that the number on object and pose recognition application in the table is actually 10 times slower than the video playing on the right side. Then how do we solve this problem on performance? So fortunately, uh, these applications are naturally presented as a data flow graph, as in the slide. Suppose we have mobile devices on the bottom and cloud infrastructure on the top. 
and they are connected through the network. The first technique that we can use is offloading, so which moves demanding stages from the mobile device to the cloud to reduce the execution time. And second technique that we can use is using parallelism. So by increasing the number of workers for our demanding stages, we can further reduce the execution time significantly. And additionally, we can process multiple frames simultaneously using pipeline parallelism. So given these techniques, our focus in high level is in the context of compute and data intensive mobile applications, which can be structured as data flow graph. How do we design? Sure. Question like, it, it seems like the mobile devices themselves are getting fast. Like people don't know what to do with like four cores on the phone. At okay. the same time, I think, so why won't just that aspect solve the problem, like versus taking everything to the cloud? Um, so, can you rephrase the question? Um, I'm, sh I'm not sure. Right. Performance on the device, right? I'm mm -hmm. saying devices are getting faster. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, you wait a couple of years, and then you can run this application on the device itself, rather than worrying about this restructuring of the app itself. Oh, okay. Which okay. actually has some fundamental limits around how far the cloud is. Okay. Okay. The, um, I think uh, this. Perception application, the three prototype application may be uh, easily enabled by the future, maybe three to four years of mobile devices. Mm -hmm. But I think people will create more demanding application with higher accuracy, um, always exceed the capability of mobile devices. And there is a, the problem in, on energy always. So I think there is a need, there will be a need to use the cloud, uh, whatever the device performs. That's my opinion. Okay. Is that the answer for your question? It's your opinion you ended, so I don't know okay. what to say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, yeah, given this, the application structure, the data flow structure, um, how do we design the underlying system that use offloading and parallelism techniques together to enable such applications? This is the high level focus of this work. To enable the goal, to, to achieve the goals, so these three fundamental questions need to be answered. The first, what factors impact offloading and parallelism between mobile devices and the cloud? And second, how do you improve the throughput and make span simultaneously, again by using offloading and parallelism techniques together? And third, how much benefits can you get compared to other strategies? So to understand the problem space, so you measure the workload and identify that there are lots of variability in the system. The graph on the right side shows the result on object and pose recognition application. The x-axis is a frame number, and y-axis is a number of shift features detected on the bottom and make span values on the top. I'm sorry, I missed it. Can you tell me again what the make span is? So make span is the end-to-end -end, the compute latency of an entire pipeline okay. yeah, for a single frame. So the, the upper graph is shows makes span values. And actually there was huge variability in scene complexity in input, which caused significant fluctuation on make span values. So for example, if we see the frame number 200, the make span value is relatively low because scene complexity is relatively moderate. But if we see the frame number 300, it has much longer make span uh, because of more safety features on the first facing node in the image. Yes. So, so to interpret that graph, you're seeing about 12 seconds of latency per frame? Yeah. In this application, everything runs locally. It is very, very slow. So I will show how my system improves the performance to a usable level. Computed the average, right? I mean, it's like some of them are 10, some of them are Right, but looking at that red line, just that would say 12 seconds to get your frame back. And this is very computer intensive. Yeah. Very computer intensive. Wait, what did you just say about it's happening locally? Yeah, so it's all happening locally. Yeah, every stage is runs locally. On the phone? On the, or? on the phone. Okay, got it. So that's why this huge make span happens. What's this? What's the sort of capability of the phone? Which phone did you use for experiments? Did so it was a netbook. At the time, 1.4 gigahertz single core. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, the Galaxy S3 has quad core 1.4 gigahertz CPU now, but at the time we don't have this uh, mobile device. 
questions? So from this, we learned that the system should adapt to the input variability at runtime because of huge variability in input. And in addition to input variability, we also explored other domains which can affect the performance. The additional domains include the different mobile devices and network condition and different choices of pipe, uh, parallelism. So all these additional domains incur more variability to the system. So we conclude that overloading and parallelism decisions should be adaptive to input and platform variability. So from the lessons from the measurement, we designed the Odessa runtime system. And let me give you a high level description of Odessa. So Odessa is a runtime built on top of Sprout. Sprout is a distributed and parallel runtime engine developed at Intel. Odessa uses the mechanisms provided by the Sprout. And Odessa runtime is com mainly comprised of two components, the application profiler and decision engine. And this application profile will deliver sequencer statistics to the decision engine using lightweight piggybacking mechanism. And thereby, decision engine can adapt offloading and parallelism decision to improve throughput and make spin simultaneously. So this as decision engine runs on mobile devices. This means some part of data flow graph will be placed on the cloud if necessary. A computer stage might be offloaded from the mobile device to the cloud, from the cloud to the mobile device. And it can also spawn more workers for demanding stages. Then how the decisions are made? This is an obvious question. Now let's look at how Odessa makes this decision. So when the application starts, the entire part is on the smartphone. Can I ask a quick question? Like, sure. Um, is the application being written for this framework, or are you doing all of this automatically? Um, I would say written for this framework. The application developer should provide the data flow structure to the runtime. So, um, again, the smartphone is on the bottom and cloud infrastructure on the top. They are connected through the network. So based on the profiler data, the decision engine knows the stage A is a bottleneck. And then it estimates the migration cost and expected execution time on the cloud and offer the stage only if the remote execution cost is less than local execution cost. And after that, the decision engine again identified the stage B as a bottleneck and offload it. And after that, it spawns one more worker for stage B since the stage B was the slowest one still. And it, at some point, network edge could be a bottleneck. Then the system estimates the offloading possibilities on both ends and takes a relevant action. So in this particular example, the system migrates a destination stage to the cloud. So overall, so this is decisions are incremental and so it adapts quickly to input and platform variability. So before talking about the performance result, here are actual data flow graph uh, for our three prototype applications. So these applications runs on top of Odessa. Yes. When you said you adapt quickly, can you just give me an idea of the time scale, how quickly? So our decision engine, for the decision making, only two to less than two milliseconds. So this is quite quick, so we can, you know, frame level. So it depends on the parameter setting. We we see we actually the profile the actual the execution time of every frames using our profile engine. So we set our window size as ten. So see the statistics for the recent ten frames and makes a decision. I have a question. Uh, so when you say adaptive, I'm just trying to understand. Does it mean that right now I'm Wi-Fi, I walk, walk out of the building, I'm not on Wi-Fi anymore, I'm on 3G? Uh -huh. um, then we may immediately switch to the phone. It would immediately switch to local processing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It may uh, bring back bring the computer stage back to the local device. Yeah, and how long does that take normally? Because you have to figure out that, oh, you know, the latencies have increased. Yeah, we will see the latency 10 frame statistics. So usually, um, it depends, as long as we, we don't lose the connectivity. Uh, within five to eight frames, we can pre back. As you can see, all these applications have, applications have varying structure and different number of computationally demanding stages. So how difficult would it be, so this is a lot of complication, how difficult would it be for me as a programmer to go in and add annotations to say, 
if if the latency, if you're on 3G, run this locally. If not, run this on the cloud, or vice versa, for a, a handful of stages. So I guess the question I'm getting at is, how complicated are these app applications, and do they actually require your adaptive mechanism? So application developer um, kind of need not to know the these dynamics. They just provide uh, reasonably fine-grained the data flow structure, and the runtime takes care of the rest automatically. Yeah, yeah no, I understand that, but my question was, how complicated are each of these pipeline stages? Could I, uh, if I were as an expert developer, and maybe I don't want to use your framework, could I come along and just make pro provide those annotations to use this underlying Sprout framework to do this statically? So I compared our performance with domain experts later, but yeah, the domain experts cannot know the every decisions correctly. So. Yeah, actually this slide shows the result, compare it. So our main, the problem was performance. So let's compare the Odessa's performance with other strategies. So we compare Odessa with uh, three other competitors, as well as one imaginary strategy that is optimized by offline method. The Rocco runs every stage run, uh, locally on mobile devices. And Offroad all runs the stage that reads image frames, as well as the stage that displays the result on the mobile device. And all other, all other stages will run on the cloud. And domain specific uses the partition suggested by the domain experts, which is the application developer in our case. And last competitor is offline optimizer. It basically exhaustively search every possible partitions and take, picks the one that gives the best result. So since the, the competition required is too expensive and it requires statistics on all possible partitions, it cannot be done online, but has to be done offline. To remind you, the throughput higher is better, the bank span lower is better. Yes. There's a lot of questions about what this data represents. Are these means or medians? What is the benchmark? What is the fraction of time spent in different network conditions? Oh, okay. Yeah. This result is on object impulse recognition application, and we use the best quality network, 100 megabits per second network for this experiment. And we use the 1.4 gigahertz CPU, the netbook, as a client. And uh, for this experiment, we run the object impulse recognition on the mobile device at the, at the beginning, and wait until the, the partition is saturated. And then see the average the frame rate, average throughput, and average make span after 100 frames to the end. If you've got effectively unlimited bandwidth, why isn't offload all going to give you the highest frames per second? Uh, offload all, why the offload all is not going to the highest throughput? That seems to be your question. And Lois, yeah, if you've got effectively a zero latency or very low latency network with uh, unlimited resources and you've got a 100 megabit network, why is that? Why would that have a lower frame per second than something that uh, than Odessa, for example? Okay. So, so why the Odessa performs better than off-road or and domain-specific technology? That's the the um, abstraction question for of your the query. The reason is I think two things. One is parallelism choice, and the other is the way, the way of partitioning the application across to the available resources. For parallelism, the domain specific uh, makes a wrong decision. The, in terms of pipeline parallelism, domain specific, the application developer doesn't know what is the right number of tokens existing on the pipeline. So how many image frames the system should process simultaneously. That decision depends a lot of on the, this device capability. So it should be uh, based on the actual profile rather than just fixed number at the beginning. So that's one very crucial reason about this performance difference. And the offload or the amount of data parallelism is, was also important. It uses just a single the detection stage, single recognition stage. While the domain specific and Odessa uses multiple um, stage for such demanding stages. So is that the answer for your question? Or? I, I guess I don't fully understand what these stages do. So I. I you're saying there's a, a, a lack of parallelism in alpha at all? Basically, yes. Yeah. So, so would so you say it's fair to say that alpha at all was implemented poorly, or? So alpha or 
choose wrong number of data parallelism and pipeline parallelism. So, for example, uh, in object and pose recognition application, there are three demanding stages safety feature extraction, modern matching, and clustering. But you know, domain specific and offroad, offroad or especially they use just one instance of safety feature extraction, one worker thread for safety feature extraction, clustering, and modern matching. So that caused the huge performance difference. And the other is pipeline parallelism. So in the given pipeline, you know, you have 10 end-to-end -end pipe stages, computer stages. And deciding the right number of frames in the pipeline at a given time is not a trivial decision. It should be based on actual profile data and so on. I think what Stuart might be asking is mm -hmm. if all the, all the changes you're talking about in Odessa don't sound like adaptive, they, might, they sound kind of like better programming in a way or better use of the data. And if those same things could happen in offload all, would offload all be as fast as Odessa? Or is there something going on sort of almost in real time and adaptive, which seemed to be the special thing about Odessa, right. that was right, is making it different than offload all? So what your but all doesn't seem to be like the like what if uh, so, so it, it doesn't seem like an optimal parallel like if I if I figure the cloud is free and I just want to burn as many resources as possible, you would presume I would go for the maximum level of parallelism and just burn the heck out of the CPU units in the cloud. And if that would seem like one of the naive strategies I'd want to compare to, it might not be terribly efficient uh, in terms of use of CPU resources if I'm throwing out state that would be useful in a less parallel situation. But that would certainly I mean, maxing out parallelism would seem to be the, the best way to the maximum frames per second. So the one problem is they don't know what the, mac, what the right number of maximum parallelism is for a given environment. That's one thing. So let me show how I decide uh, the pipeline parallelism. Just a clarification question. So offload, all, is, that, is that something that you implemented, or were you using some other system that just you know, was offloading this? So I use the mechanisms provided by Sprout. So they provide the basic yeah, offloading structures. So yeah, let me show. Uh, So I think last, last result, so depending on the application, since it is adaptive to a given environment, so the degree of pipeline parallelism should change accordingly, right? But the domain experts and this off-road or strategy cannot know this right number of degree of pipeline parallelism. As well as, um, so in my experiment, the off-road or doesn't use the maximum degree of data parallelism. That's why the performance is too. So it was set. So it was kind of set at a fixed low level, whereas your system will vary it dynamically and it will go higher than that level that you picked for offload all. What if you just picked a higher level? Though? Would that would that suffer badly? Error. Uh, higher level. What? what higher level of parallelism in the offload all case. And then the the max pen will suffer because the all consecutive frames will wait before the bottleneck stage. Mm -hmm. So we need to be careful about choosing degree of, degree of pipeline parallelism. So you, you, Odessa is doing three different things you've described so far mm -hmm. in terms of improving this. One is it's deciding which pipeline stages to upload to offload to the cloud. Okay. Secondly, it's deciding what degree of parallelism to put at each of those stages. Right. And thirdly, it's making adaptive decisions about those as conditions change. Right. Can you give us a breakdown for this example you've been showing us, the one on the, the previous slide before you jumped here? Which of those things matters? It, it seems like, in particular, the decision about which stages to upload is not relevant. It's not the, the reason that Odessa is beating offload all 
is not because there's some stage that's really important to do on the client. Uh, I'm guessing, I and mean, you're wrong. Can, can you give us a breakdown of which of those things matters in this example? Oh, in this example, okay. The example you had before, that, that chart. I think I have an example. So this is an example. The um, so let me show the resulting partitions. So this is the result on object tempo select function application. The resulting partitions are uh, something like this. So there are three demanding stages, but the Odessa offered only two stages and increased the uh, data parallelism like this and controlled the pipeline parallelism also. The notable difference is it executes uh, clustering stage locally. So the Odessa can use the more resources on the cloud for the other stages. Right? Compared to offload or the, the domain specific technology which may use the maximum data parallelism whatever we set, that may be wrong. Right? But the Odessa uses uh, the necessary uh, computation resource locally and utilize the cloud side resources more um, more the right way. Are you saying that this is actually optimal here, doing four network round trips rather than taking that middle stage and pushing that up to the cloud, that the performance would be worse if that middle blue rectangle there were pushed up onto the cloud? So it de depends a lot on the amount of data that will be transferred between the stages. So in this... How, how could that possibly, possibly be worse than this? So actually, but let's... So my Odessa algorithm is, works based on the bottleneck stage. So I measured every stage's execution time. So execution time of blue rectangle, mm -hmm. and execution the delay of the every network edge, mm -hmm. and execution time of red rectangle also, and try to reduce the execution time of the bottleneck link or stage. Mm -hmm. So that makes sure this is better than the other partitions. So you're right? not skeptical of that result. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not skeptical about this result. I am highly skeptical of this result. Um, this number I mean, is if actually. You push that rectangle, if you push that blue rectangle up there, you're going to save two network round trips. Excuse me, you're going to save one network round trip, two network ops. And you're going to be able to use a higher performance core up in the cloud than you are down on, on your client machine. Mm -hmm. it's, it may be a small win, but it's got to be a win in terms of performance. So that depends on the, the congestion on the cloud side, right? So if you offload the middle stage on the, the, on, on the top, maybe, maybe performance is a little better, but the throughput is governed by the bottleneck stage still. Throughput will not increase, right? So, so the, I, I'm trying to optimize both the max span and throughput simultaneously, mm -hmm. whatever the cost is. Offload the single stage to the cloud may not increase the throughput at all because bottleneck stage That's execution really time. Hurting. Sorry? It certainly will not hurt it. It would not be any worse. Maybe, yeah, maybe. But I'm not saying the, my resulting partition is globally optimal. I just increase the both metrics simultaneously. Keep going on. So your assumption sure. is that the cloud itself could be resource limited at some point? Yes. Compared to using the mobile. Here it is a core machine. It will spawn more threads. It will slow down. Right. Any other questions? Okay, then let me get back to the result. Uh, yeah, Odessa outperformed against three other competitors, and even compared to the offline optimizer, it gets comparable throughput. And although different, there are considerable amount of related work in this space. Yeah, first set of approach is using the integer linear programming, and second set of approach, sorry, it's based on graph-based partitioning method to optimize custom utility function. And third approach is using static partitioning scheme. The application partitions will be determined at compile time. And fourth ones are switching between pre-specified partitions, um, either by the application developers or uh, domain experts. So these are not providing the relevant solution for ours because the objectives are different. And because of huge variability, so static or fixed partitioning schemes will not work. And none of these considers the parallelization of demanding stages on mobile devices. So that's uh, so 
Well, this uh, achieves our goal using the incremental and dynamic runtime, which adopts input and platform variability at runtime. To summarize Odessa, some emerging applications are too heavy to run on mobile devices. So Odessa enables interactive perception applications by dynamically adapting to the input and platform variability. So I'm moving to the second piece of my work. So when uh, we just enable the mobile perception applications, so when you, want, when you want to share the recognized result using the cloud, you may have a privacy problem. So this work is about how to protect our privacy when sharing the photos. So cloud-based photo sharing services, henceforth PSPs, are becoming very popular nowadays. So people use these various mobile devices to share photos and upload it to PSPs using wireless network. But we will have serious privacy concerns. Here is an example. Suppose Alice has a secret picture of a nice guy and want to share it with friends using PSP. First possible concern, privacy concern in this situation is the unexpected exposure of user's photo, which could happen either by accidental bugs or careless system designed by PSP. The second problem might be we don't have any mechanism to prevent PSP's data abuse. So in this particular example, the people may use their best possible inference algorithm on user's photo and may conclude the following. So this is obviously not a desirable scenario for Alice. But currently, there is no way to prevent this scenario. We need to completely trust PSPs in order to share our photos. So I was not making up artificial threats, so, but they are real ones. Here are four recent news headlines. The photo bucket system unexpectedly exposed the user's photos because of their naive system design. The problem was their photo URL was too easy to guess. Thereby, the, what the attacker needs to know is just a user ID. And besides, the Facebook had a face recognition API in their web-based data API specification. But because of privacy issues partially described in this slide, they eventually shut down the API. And not a long time ago, the Instagram tried to change their terms of service, saying that they can sell users' photos without having data owner's permission. It caused a big ruckus, so the company reverted back to the original term. So these privacy concerns are real to many users. So on the other hand, PSPs provide the useful processing for mobile devices. Again, suppose Alice has a brand new smart camera and takes a high resolution photo and upload it to a PSP. Then you know, and the, her, the Alice's friend may have a mobile device with different screen sizes. In order to provide desirable user experience, the PSPs will scale the image appropriately and send them to the different mobile devices. So these types of processing, so-called image scalability service, are very useful for users to reduce network latency and bandwidth usage significantly. Also, it is possible that the PSPs can perform other types of processing, uh, for example, filtering operation to enhance image quality. So, the cloud is already doing useful processing for mobile devices, and people get tremendous benefits from that. And the problem is <coughs> that we want to have both privacy protection and cloud-side processing. So solving this problem, especially under, under practical constraints, is quite tricky. So I may immediately think that as a potential solution, why not just encrypt everything? But if the photo is fully encrypted on the cloud, PSPs cannot perform any useful processing on users' photos. So as a result, for example, the mobile devices should download full resolution images, regardless of their screen size and storage size limitation. This is unacceptable. So if you use full encryption, we will lose image scalability service, as well as the other benefits provided by the providers. And what should we do? So before describing our approach, so I will describe our goals, trend model, and assumptions that we made. So again, our goal is to protect users' privacy with the cloud-side processing. And our threat model covers two categories of threats. So one is the unauthorized access, and the other is the application of automatic recognition technology on users' photos. 
And our trust boundary is in between mobile devices and the cloud, which means that we completely trust mobile devices, hardware, and software. Those include sensors, operating system codes, and apps, etc. And we don't trust others, including eavesdroppers on the network and PSPs. For PSPs, we assume that they are honest but curious, so which again means that they will not change what they are doing for users' photos, no matter what. But they will try to infer users' personal information using their best, best possible method. So now I will, I'm describing the our approach in high level. So again, suppose Alice wants to share a photo with Bob. From the photo, we first extract small, but has very important visual information, which we called a secret part. So one can, think it as, uh, one can think of it as the most significant, significant, significant bits of the entire image. And I will describe how exactly we construct the secret part later after this slide. And after removing a secret part, what remains has a large volume, but has little visual information, which we call a public part in this talk. Again, one can think of it as least significant bits of the entire image data. And public part is the standard JPEG image so the PSPs can accept it without changing their system. So ensuring the secret part will be encrypted and ideally embedded inside the public part, and then images will be uploaded to a PSP. And this way, PSPs can perform any processing, any useful processing on, um, on the public part. In this particular example, uh, they scale down the image for serving the mobile device. When Bob wants to see the photo, he downloads both public and secret part and combines those two to reconstruct the image. To enable this capability, we have several important requirements. So our, our algorithm should ensure, has to, be, has to ensure privacy on the public part. And storage overhead should be minimized. Uh, our encryption and decryption process should be lightweight. And our public part should maintain a standard compliance, in our case, JPEG image. And the cloud should be able to process the public part appropriately. And the resulting system should transparently work with the existing PSPs. So overall, the, our algorithm and system, the collectively called P3, achieved these goals and requirements. And I will describe why our system and algorithm works in later slides. Yes? So outside processing should be enabled. Do you assume what, uh, what they can do to your data? Yeah, I will describe it later. Yeah. So before describing actual encryption and decryption algorithm, I want to share the intuition behind the P3 algorithm. So how do we extract small but important information from the given image? So in this work, we focused on a widely used image format, JPEG image compression standard. So in JPEG, when compressing the image, an image is divided into many small patches. The size of one patch is 8 by 8. On these patches, the JPEG performs DCT, the discrete cosine transform. Then, the location in this left grid corresponds to different frequency values. So if we draw the histograms of all coefficients from the all patches in the image, they will look like this. In each histogram, the center position have zero values, denoted as blue line here. Then, the first fact that you can exploit is that the DCT coefficients of natural images are sparse. So in general, more energy is concentrated on the top left corner, which has low frequency values. Especially zero frequency values are called DC coefficient, DC component, and has significant visual information. And the second thing that we can use is, we see that the signs of coefficients are evenly distributed because the histograms are mostly symmetric. So if we take out those values, it is very hard for attackers to correctly recover the values. And third, certainly magnitude of coefficients have some information. So to exploit this fact, P3 takes all three components out to degrade the public part as much as possible. Now I'm ready to describe how P3 encryption works. So from the given image, we get quantized DCT coefficients. First, we take out the DC components, which has significant visual information. And for remaining AC coefficients, we cut their magnitude using fixed threshold T. Then each cropped regions are treated separately with their signs. 
So inner part of the coefficients will form a public part, which become another JPEG file, and will be stored and processed by a PSP system. And outer part of the coefficient will be combined with the DC components and form a secret part, which has small size but has important and significant visual information. And the secret part will be encrypted when it goes out of the mobile device. So note that we successfully eliminate three important components that I discussed in the previous slide. DC, and magnitude by thresholding, and signs taken for a secret part. The next question is, now we have this P3 encryption algorithm. So how well this algorithm works in practice? So I implement this algorithm. And the first result to show is threshold versus storage trade-off. So in this, yes? In your previous slide, uh, when you cut the threshold, if it's higher than the threshold, do you take the whole thing and store it, or only the delta part above the threshold? Delta part above the threshold, and remain the threshold in the public part. So we, we messed up the sign information on the public. So in this graph, uh, we applied our algorithm in INEA data set, which has 1,491 different images. The next axis of this graph is P3 threshold used, and Y axis is normalized average file size compared to the original image. So naturally, original sizes are all one in blue color, and secret part is in red, and public part is in green, and some of the public and secret parts are in black. So results are very encouraging. The, even if we consider the worst case, the total file size increases only by 20%. If you see the individual file size, the size of public and secret parts are almost even at threshold one. After that, the volumes are moving to the public part as we increase the threshold. So based on this result and the privacy evaluation on the public part, we set our operating range, the P3's operating range as one to 20. Then the next question might be, what information will be exposed in our operating range in the public part? So I used one example image from USCCP data set, which has some of the canonical images. So when you set the threshold as 20, which is the strongest privacy setting in our scheme, the image looks like this. So if you are familiar with the image data, the USCCP data set, you may recognize some structure here. But depending on who you are, one may have a hard time to recognize what is in the image. If I decrease the threshold, the image becomes more secure. This is 15. 10, 5, and 1. So if you set the threshold as 1, the visually it is almost impossible to recognize anything. And for your reference, I will present the original image. It looks like this. And I will present the secret part with their threshold as, as I increase the threshold. This is secret part with threshold 1, 5, 10, 15, As I increase the threshold, the naturally less information will remain in the secret part, and more, more volumes will go to the public part. So we have seen how P3 encrypts the image and its basic trade-off. Yes? So you look at you know, the adversary who is trying to reconstruct this information, or are you just using the standard? I just use standard default. So, so it might be possible to reconstruct more of the image if you, you know, try, try to do so? Uh, that's a good question. We, have, we don't have the mathematical proofs of our security guarantees. Um, in the evaluation, I will show our, the evaluation methodology. We use automatic recognition technology and so on. Yeah. I mean, to show our, in particular, intuition for that is that there's a line of work on looking at image statistics in you know, higher order statistics and images and you know, detecting things like modifications to images. And all of that work works because there are pretty strong structure, there's strong structure in natural images, and I'm wondering whether, you know, my intuition is that if one can look, one can apply similar techniques here and, you know, priors about the, about the relationships among, you know, nearby pixels in, in real, in natural images, and recover a lot of natural images from not very many bits, you know, from these LSB bits that you're, that you're keeping the public image. I think, I think that's, I think uh, thinking about the adversary here probably matters a lot because of how much, because, because there's so much because you make such strong assumptions about the about the set of images that can be you know that can that can make it through your filter. Right. Thanks for the comment. But okay. Yeah. 
we, we haven't tried such image forensic techniques in our scheme yet. Um, so we, we show the how P3 encrypts the image and its basic trade-off. Then what about the decryption? How about the decryption? So for decrypting, decrypting the image, we are facing one very interesting challenges because of this cloud-side processing. So suppose, again, the elites want to share a photo with Bob. Since the public part is stored and processed by a PSP system, the receiver will get the unprocessed secret part with a processed version of public part. Then the challenge is, can you reconstruct, sorry, can you reconstruct the processed version of original image using the given information on the receiver side? So if you can express the original image um, as a linear combination of secret and public part, so this problem becomes more straightforward. But this, it is not the case in our setting because we, our P3 ar encryption algorithm hides the sign information on the public part. Then how do you solve this problem? So as I mentioned, the original image is not just a linear combination of secret and public part. So it turns out that the correct equation for the original image must include a compensation term C. And our analysis result shows this, C, this compensation term C can be derived from the secret part, S, which we already have on the receiver side. Therefore, we still can handle any linear processing. And for photos, this linear processing can handle many useful functions, the scaling, cropping, sharpening, blending, smoothing. Is that the answer for your question before? So based on this P3 encryption and decryption algorithm, we design a P3 system that can transparently work with existing PSPs. So P3 takes on interposition architecture. So it requires trusted man-in-domain proxy on the device, on the mobile device, and as well as the cloud-side storage space. So it would be ideal uh, if we can store the secret part together with the public part onto the PSP system. And the JPEG standard does allow the embedding application specific information into the binary. But in reality, most PSPs will eliminate this application specific information when they receive the photos from the users. So we take this alternative approach based on the external storage space. So the on-device proxy will perform P3 encryption and decryption when it uploads or downloads um, the photos. And cloud-side storage space will store encrypted secret, secret part. And public part will be stored and processed by a PSP. So P3 architecture is fairly easy to be implemented with existing PSPs, and we don't require to change the PSP's infrastructure. So we, sure. So let's say if there are two, uh, two copies of the same image, and then if I use the same threshold, and then um, the public part should be the same, right? Right. So, and I assume that public part is also kind of, since it's sparse, it's kind of, you can, you can use public part as a kind of signature of an image. Okay. Uh, signature of the image, what? You are, you are saying the attack king scenario or? Right, so an attacker or whatnot, right? So let's say you know, I have an Im image of, I don't know, Justin Bieber. And then, you know, the public part of the image, right? So let's say there, are, even if there are, so, I don't know, like hundreds of millions of images out there, uh, if the public part uh, encodes kind of unique, in, uh, unique bits uh, corresponding to an image, then just you know, knowing the public part, you can identify what's the original image, right? If you access to secret part, that means you are no, my friend. Just, just having the public part, you can almost guarantee that you can identify, you can map to an original image. That's so not if the original if image you is had also original available out on the internet somewhere. Mm -hmm. The if, the original I think one of the exceptions was that he trusts the software and the hardware on the mobile device. If the mobile yeah. device and the device of the user is the only one displaying that image. Right, yeah, but, but, but there are many other scenarios, right? You know, like, so I want to find out who has posted the picture of Justin Bieber, right? For instance, then I have a picture of Justin Bieber. I create a public part. Then I can just scan the entire publicly available images and then find out that which public part of the image is the Justin Bieber's 
the public right. part of the Justin Bieber yeah. yeah, that's what you're saying is like if, if they're identical images, if a hash of the public part is a hash of the image. Right, right. And then this is, it looks like this public part, since it's very sparse, uh, looks like you know could be very one-on-one -on -one mapping, not yeah. many-to-one mapping yeah. from the original yeah. image to the. Right. Currently, my scheme um, doesn't solve your problem. I, I assume kind of this image is not publicly available all the time. But I think one way to address that problem is whenever we upload a public part to the PSP, we, we may inject a random uh, overlapping images. We may add random overlapping images depending on the users. Then, then may hide. This uh, capability to reconstruct the original image with this secret port if you inject something. So the receiver, if the receiver knows the, yeah. But yeah, you have valid point, yes. Thanks for the instead point. of constant threshold, you have some randomized threshold and, and encoded that in the private part, I think. Yeah. Oh, that's what's doing. Yeah. Any other questions? The point is that this isn't really encryption as much as reversible obfuscation. Uh, because encryption requires, re encryption, encryption implies that you have a key, and if you're not the person who has a key, you can't. Under most definitions of security for encryption, it, it means that you, uh, without the key, you can't tell if the encrypted message is the encryption of a given plain text. But in this case, if you have a if you have a plain text, you can tell whether this is the encryption of that plain text. Okay. So. Let me move on to the next part. So we actually implemented all necessary components on real devices and with Facebook system. Um, this prototype is built on top of the, one of the latest smartphone, the Samsung Galaxy S3. And here is a screenshot on the device and the delay numbers on the device also. So receiver without relevant password or relevant key will basically see the gray image on the right side. Depending on the threshold, it may change rather than the original image on the left side. And also delay numbers are moderate. So the P3 is practical and can be implemented with a real system like Facebook. Sure. So let's say the two of us are friends and you posted this image um, onto Facebook. Mm -hmm. But you wanted to share it with me, right? So how does sharing work in that case? Because I should be able to see the picture too, right? Right. Um, so, so what do I need to um, so you need access to the friends graph from Facebook at Vizium, right? Right, right. And um, you need to disseminate this information to me, the secret part to me, and somehow there needs to be some layer which combines this two. Right, right. So as I described in our system in the previous slide, so this layer, the P3 trusted, yeah, that part will do encryption and decryption. And uh, we extensively evaluate P3's privacy aspect using PSNR and representative set of this computer vision algorithms, computer vision based algorithms. And essentially, all results are saying that PSNR is so low and all this recognition technology becomes useless with the public part. So, P3 preserves privacy. So, in this talk, I'm going to show the two results uh, edge detection and face recognition. So, for edge detection technique, uh, the first result is on the edge detection technique. We applied can edge detection on the public parts. So these images are from USC CP data set, the three canonical images. If you use threshold as one and apply can edge, de edge detection technique, they will look like this. It is almost impossible to recognize anything. But if we increase the threshold to 10, they will look like this. So again, if you are familiar with the data set, you may recognize, especially in the middle, the image. But still how to recognize something on the, the right side. If we increase the threshold to 20, which is the weakest setting, they look like this. Okay. So next, in the next slide, I will present um, the original image of these three Im uh, images, and together with the Kenny edge detection results on the original image. So they will look like this. And the second result to show is on face recognition. So we use eigenface uh, algorithm with the color face database for the evaluation. 
And we use Colorado State University's face recognition evaluation system, which is basically devised um, for evaluating, the, comparing the different face recognition algorithms. So we, we examine the recognition performance under various settings. So different probing sets, which is in the database, and different distance metrics, and different P3 threshold used, and public parts as a training set, as a new training set for mimicking the advanced attacker. Here is the result on, yes. For the canonical phase, did you process them through the similar algorithm you had? This is going back to Jayon's question, I guess. Or did you keep the original phase as the, as the recognition target? So I, um, I tried both. So I'm going to present the result on the letter case, public part. So also train the faces using the public part of the training set. And yeah. So here is the result on the worst case. So x axis is uh, the recognition rank, and y axis is a cumulative recognition rate. I am I'm following the methodology provided by the FedEx database community. And the upper upper line uses the normal training and public normal training and probing set. And the below two lines uses public part as a training and probing set. So each line uses different threshold. The green line uses 20, and red line uses 1. So first, if we consider this point, which gives the best recognition rate from the perspective of, of an attacker, so which has the 50, rank 50, and about 40% recognition rate. So intuitively, what it means is that for an unknown face, there exists a right answer among top 51 candidate faces with 40% probability. So if we just consider the top recognition rate, which is those two points, the green line has about 15% recognition rate, and the red line has 2% recognition rate. So note that even if attackers get the 15% recognition rate, she already have, uh, she only have this public part, so it would be very hard to verify what, whether the result is right or not. So all other results using different threshold and the normal training set shows the worst recognition rate than the green line here. So overall, the face recognition is broken. So although not useful for our purpose, so there are considerable amount of related ones in this space, again. So fully homomorphic encryption um, uh, enables arbitrary processing on the encrypted data. But they are too expensive to be used in the, the high-dimensional high data, like photo and video. And they require to change PSPs infrastructure significantly. And the second, work, second set of work is on the privacy on video surveillance literature. So they do masking, blurring, pixelation, and scrambling coefficient, etc. But they are either fragile to recognition techniques or they increase file size too much. And third set of the third, select, there are considerable, considerable amount of related work in selective encryption literature. They do all useful things, but all these works are done at, uh, in late 1990s. Uh, at that time, they just focused on the reducing of the amount of computation on the device. So none of these can handle the full requirement of P3 algorithm. For example, the reconstruction challenge uh, due to the cloud-side processing, none of these existing algorithms can handle. So P3 is a kind of selective encryption algorithm, but a unique one tailored to the novel requirements. So summarizing P3, the cloud service providers already providing useful processing for mobile devices. And P3 protect our privacy against providers while maintaining the cloud-side processing. Yes? So, do you have a definition for useful on the cloud-side processing? What operations are possible? Um, as I described, all linear processing that we can handle. If it's non-linear, we can we cannot. So let's say you're talking to Mark Zuckerberg, and you have this technology where he needs to spend a couple million dollars implementing it, so that he gets less data than 99% of the users are today willing to give him. What would your argument to any of these <coughs> providers be for providing any of this stuff? Uh, so, what is the benefit of the PSP to provide this technology, or? No, what is the in incentive for any cloud provider to do this? So. Right. The, um, we kind of assume that 
the PSPs will eventually cooperate to our scheme. The argument for this is for Facebook, for example, um, so they may want more users. So there are privacy conscious users who is very reluctant to use this kind of sharing environment. Then um, they, Facebook may devise a paid these services for that kind of users to increase their user base. Right? That's kind of argument that I have right now. We have data to support that. Um, we have, we don't, I don't have these concrete numbers. Yeah. But there are, you know, in, the, in this space, there are many startups nowadays. So actually, some, yeah, certainly some people are interested in this direction. So we have examined two examples of the, how we enable efficient processing and secure sharing of sensor data using the cloud. So now I'll give a brief overview of other two pieces of my work and conclude the talk. Um, I also explored the other interesting domains. So the first, there is emerging demands on large-scale sensor data collection and processing from the corpus of smartphone users. So crowd sensing is a novel capability that combines power of crowds with sensors on smart mobile devices. The main key observation here is that there is a lack of support um, to automate this labor-intensive task. So I built a high-level programming framework for crowd sensing applications. Uh, now the users can just give a high-level description, and the runtime takes care of the rest automatically. And second, whenever we share large volumes of sensor data using the cloud, we will have an energy problem, energy concerns. The key observation here is given the delay-tolerant mobile applications, existence of multiple wireless network interfaces and time-varying wireless network, it may make sense to defer the transmission opportunity rather than sending it immediately. So I designed an online algorithm that governs these transmission decisions. And the algorithm called SARSA can effectively trade off energy and delay uh, by intelligently deferring the transmission opportunity. So I'm summarizing my entire work in Hyderabad. So now uh, we have Odessa to enable the mobile perception applications, which is data and compute intensive uh, workloads. With P3, we made a solid step forward to protect users' privacy while maintaining their cloud size processing. And with Medusa, we enable the largest scale sensor data collection and processing from the smartphone crowds. And with Sarsa, so we can effectively trade off energy and delay uh, when using the delay tolerant mobile applications. So at this time, I want to thank my collaborators. So without their support, I may not be here as a candidate today. So finally, future work. So in the future, I want to broaden my research horizon and make our personal computing environment uh, more efficient and secure. So I categorize my, the future work as two things. The first, I'm interested in building infrastructure support for mobile devices in the future, so which, may, which includes the essential primitives for the mobile devices, like the location and notification services. Also, making the mobile systems scalable and privacy preserving. And second, I'm also very interested in uh, making multimedia data sharing and processing secure and efficient in our personal computing environment. The examples include the privacy preserving video sharing and the making the heavy processing on media data efficient and secure on our personal computing environment. And thank you. I conclude my talk at this point, and I'd be happy to take any more questions. Okay. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you disseminate this secret data? I'm a little curious about that. Um, so you have you have this public and uh, yeah, the public and the secret part. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how you disseminate the secret? Sure. Uh, For this secret part of the image, that is going to the cloud size storage. When when you upload the photos, on the device you divide the image into two parts. And public part will go to the Facebook, for example. And secret part will go to the Dropbox, for example. And then when the receiver wants to see the photo, he downloads the public part from the Facebook. And it also gives the unique photo ID. And using the photo ID, you retrieve the secret part from the Dropbox. Right? Then in that way, you can reconstruct the secret and public together on the device side. And yeah, that's how it is. 
And for the key, we assume that the key should be distributed offline, out of band. Yeah. Is that the answer for the question? Yeah. Okay, we don't have any more questions in uh, here. I just take them once again.